Okay, we're back with another podcast. I'm really excited about the guest that we have for you guys today. This is a first for us. This is uh, gonna be a treat for everybody. I'm hoping to learn a lot. I think I will. We've got a uh, head chef from Dandelion Cafe, JC, on the podcast with us today. JC, why don't you tell everybody hi and just a little bit of background on who you are. How are y'all doing? Um, you said, uh, currently head chef, uh, part owner of Dandelion Cafe in uh, Houston, Texas. A um, little bit about me, I've uh, always wanted to cook. Um, never knew I wanted it to be my career, but it was always something I loved. Um, decided to do it probably after my second year in college. Went full uh, board with it and went to culinary school. Um, graduated from that, got into a big country club and a lot of French fine dining um, food that we were doing there. And uh, ever since then, I've kind of jumped around all aspects of the hospitality industry. I've been doing it now for about 12 years, uh, 12 years culinary. Um, and, you know, it's uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of creativity, a lot of fun. And it's something I love to do. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you have to like climb your way up the ranks or how did that whole thing work? Um, yeah, I think that is pretty much the ins and outs of hospitality or culinary especially you know um, you'll hear a lot of stories about people who like start off as a dishwasher and then make their way up to being head chef you know so uh, no one really ever comes in um, just being like the top guy it's definitely a lot of inter uh, in internships or externships a lot of training under people um, working for well-known places and um, as you grow your trait, you know, definitely uh, move up. So same thing for me. Yeah, that makes sense. So just a little bit of background. Um, Dandelion Cafe is actually right down the street from the gym that Blakely used to own in Houston. And Sarah mm -hmm. opened that gym, I want to say within, I don't know, maybe the same month that um, Blakely opened the gym, they opened at the same time. So there's always been kind of like a a cool relationship between Danny line that was even before you came on board there. And from what I remember, actually, yeah, Sarah never even really had the, she wanted to have a coffee shop and then the customers started demanding food. <laughs> so um, I'm glad. Yeah. That that's how it went. Her. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you, you know, as I think back to all the times that we came to Danny Lion, like one thing I remember was that there was always a lot of regulars there. So I think that's a testament to, the business that you guys run there. I mean, if you have repeat customers, that means you're doing something right. And it was always a tradition for us to head over there multiple times per week after a workout and hang out. So I know you guys are doing an awesome thing over there. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. we definitely try. And uh, we definitely have a lot of repeat customers um, more than any place I've ever worked. Um, so yeah, it just, it just proves that we have loyal um, customers and now we're doing something right and we're just trying yeah. to keep it up and you know hopefully expand through all this craziness yeah so i guess before i get too lost in questions i should ask if people want to know more about dandelion or, or your social media where should they find you guys um dandelion social media is um dandelion houston um across all platforms so mainly instagram facebook um we have dandelionhouston.com uh, has our menu, any, any um, new upcoming things we have going on. Uh, we do a lot of, um, like we're doing something with a influencer on uh, Instagram right now where we're doing a picnic giveaway. Um, so we have like cool stuff like that that you can follow us and find out about, um, whether we're doing sales or specials, because uh, I love doing specials. So anytime I have the time to, you know, I like to pull one out on the weekend, whether it's like, uh, barbacoa and eggs or, you know, cause Dandelion is a brunch spot. So it kind of takes me away from, from my dinner fine dining background and I get to uh, wake up at the crack of dawn and <laughs> serve people food. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's awesome that you kind of have that creative outlet to do that kind of stuff too. And it, it, I've seen that your menu evolve over the years too. So that's, that's awesome. Okay. So yeah, it's still evolving too. I want to take advantage of all the knowledge that you have because I don't know a lot about cooking. I feel like a lot of our clients, they struggle uh, both with cooking at home and they also struggle with staying on track with their 
nutrition goals and they want to eat out at restaurants a lot, either for convenience or for, so, for social reasons. So I want to kind of pull back the curtain of some of your knowledge as to what's going on behind the scenes and, and maybe some good takeaways for people as they think about eating out in restaurants and cooking at home. So um, why don't you just kind of explain the, some of the general ways that food is prepared in restaurants? Because I think of us, a lot of us probably never even put thought into it if we never worked into a restaurant. And I know there's a lot of difference, but differences between, you know, everything from sous vide to flat tops to grills and all that kind of stuff. So maybe speak a little bit on that. Okay, well, and it really depends on what cuisine or um, what kind of restaurant you're in. So. Yeah. If you're at a fine dining establishment, you're definitely gonna have different cooking techniques compared to if you're at a chain restaurant, let's say. Um, and you know, you can have fried, grilled, sauteed. Um, one of my favorites being braised, um, like braised meats, braised proteins. That's one of my uh, favorite techniques. Um, so in the restaurant industry, um, the definite goal is to have people happy with your food right they want they want you want customers coming back so you always want a good quality food also entangled with that is a fast turnover with tables or you know just getting the tickets out in a timely manner so a lot of times you're going to have whether it is fine dining or whether it is a chain like a fast food place majority of places are going to par cook in some way shape or form you know like you said sous vide um I don't know if you know the technique of sous vide, um, but it, it's educate pretty much me, cooking the food. Educate me on that, on braised. T t yeah. Tell me, tell me what that is. Tell me what braised is. Tell me about what par cooking is. Par cooking. So par cooking is pretty much just cooking the food some of the way, you know, taking it to a certain point. Like one of the things I like to do at the house is I'll par cook my vegetables. So I'll take my green beans and I will put it in like a boiling water, maybe throw some aromatics like onion, celery, carrot in there, um, some spices, some white wine or whatever, throw it in the water and pretty much blanch it. Throw it in there for around a minute, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Take it out, throw it in some cold water. That's like a blanching technique. And that's also par cooking. So I can put it in the refrigerator and whenever I want to eat it rapidly, like I get home off of work, I can throw it in a pan, saute it with like some onions, and it will already be like half the way there. Uh, it allows it to stay crisper. It allows it to keep its color better. Um, and it allows for a quicker cooking hmm. time. Um, so you're gonna see that pretty much across the board in restaurants. They'll do it with proteins, uh, vegetables, uh, starches, you know, so, and the reason they're, they're doing that is to meet both goals. They're trying to find the best product or trying to give the customer the best product food wise and also trying to be as fast as possible. So tables aren't, you know, waiting around too long, you know, yeah. for their, for their food. Um, braising technique is usually used on proteins. So this is, and I, um, you know, when I think of digital barbell and trying to eat healthier, I think Braising technique for me is one of the best techniques for getting your flavor with also getting something that doesn't have too many oils, um, fats, you know, depending on what a protein you use. So if you braise like chicken or you braise like beef, you're going to put a hard sear on it, add, add aromatics. And when I say aromatics, I mean carrots, onion, celery is pretty much what chefs call aromatics, you know, garlic, herbs. Those are your aromatics that you'll add to your dish. Um, and you'll sear your meat hard, take it out. Um, sometimes you'll add a little flour to just kind of what you want to do is um, there's something called fond. Uh, it's pretty much the grit and stuff you'll get at the bottom of the pan, like right before burning. Have you ever like experienced that when you're cooking something and it starts, you know, getting that grit and you're like, oh man, that's not a bad thing for braising. That's a good thing for braising. You want that, right? And so you can add beer, wine, even water, stock chicken stock vegetable stock to the pan when that grid is kind of taking place and that liquid will help bring it up and you can kind of just scrape it off the bottom of the pan like with a wooden spoon or like a rubber spatula and then you will add the rest of your liquid you'll add your meat and you'll add your aromatics and you can put it uncovered in a 
oven at like a low temperature for depending on the meat you know hour hour and a half two hours mm -hmm. braising technique is definitely a longer a longer uh, time cooking it right and so you'll have shit restaurants like i worked at they'll do a braising technique first let's say as a prep you know like probably start that eight in the morning um have that done by like noon cool it down and you'll have portions that you like separate from the liquid so then you have your meat you have your liquid separate it and then come dinner time if an order comes in i want that braised beef or braised what have you you'll take it out it's pretty much all the way cooked you know it's still together and you can just throw that in a pan with the braising liquid that you separated before and it will just heat up bring it to a boil and not only is your braising liquid your source for heating up your uh, meat all the way through but it's also your sauce at the end of the dish and you know with that technique there's not a lot of oils not a lot of fats except the fats that are coming from the protein yeah um yeah and so th that's definitely one uh there's tons you know like well, i'm, I'm still learning some stuff here. every day huh? so so with that technique let's say um i wanted to do um a pound of chicken breast and i wanted to braise it um we're talking about cooking this in like a cast iron okay. pan i assume something like that cast iron uh is definitely a great one because it holds heat so well uh, and and you know you don't have to deal with like when you're scraping the pan you don't have to worry about anything like a lot of the teflon pans have where it might come off uh so cast iron's good also if you wanted to if you didn't have cast iron um like a sauce pot like a large base sauce pot would work you would just have to transfer it into like a baking uh like a baking dish almost so from that transfer from the stove top to the oven you would also transfer the meat, transfer that liquid, yeah. transfer those arom aromatics yeah. from the sear into the oven. That's what I was wondering about. You have to, I was thinking, do you have to cook this? On, do you have to sear it in a pan that can go in the oven? But that makes sense. You can transfer it over. So like if, we, mm -hmm. if we we're going to do this um, and we wanted to have, you know, meat for, let's say, three days, how would we do that process? Would we still just sear, you know, four pounds of chicken until it's like complete all the way up to 165 degrees and then cook it in the oven the night that we wanted to eat it or how would we do that um if you wanted to have it like leftovers right so i would say that one day definitely finish the process that day so you don't have to really worry about um because through that braising technique you're building your flavors um with the sear, with the aromatics, with the, they call it deglazing, adding that liquid to get the fond and then putting it in the oven and cooking it for however long. Once you've done that and you're able to pull it out, let it cool it, um, bring it down to like room temperature, cool it down a little bit, um, separate your, you don't have to separate your liquids from your meat. Mm. Um, that's just something that's done professional kitchens. But once it's cooled down, you can cover it um, even separate it into portions if you like and throw it in your fridge and then once you're ready to eat it you can go in the oven you can go in the microwave and just heat it up and it will be ready to go okay that makes sense oh man that's, that's that's awesome okay so i took us down a rabbit hole there um for my own personal knowledge of how to do this we might go back to that more because i think that's pretty practical for a lot of our listeners but um let's go back to the restaurant so we've got these different cooking techniques and I would say overall the biggest thing that our clients struggle with two main things when they go out to restaurants is um, the portions that food is served in and then um, not being able to account for kind of the hidden calories in foods. So let's talk a little bit about um, in all these different cooking methods if our goal is to kind of eliminate the calories that we don't see and by that I kind of mean the cooking oils and butters and things like that. What are some dishes that might have, um, or, or ways of preparation that I have, might have more of that than others? And what are some like techniques that our clients can use when they're ordering food to try to minimize that kind of stuff? That makes sense? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so sauteing would probably be, if you see something that's sauteed on a, a menu, that usually will have a good amount of oil and most places that are sit down restaurants are gonna add butter at the end of a sauteing process um 
you know, yeah, I mean, general thought process and how to happen. On top of the oil, it goes the butter. On top of the oil, yeah, that's all for sure. You know, add that butter and like the general uh, thought process and hospitality industry is butter is better. So, you know, you, it's always like, what can we add this butter to? Um, and a lot of people are just thinking like the, that, you know, it comes with like, oh, that's where the flavor is. And um, sad as it is, that's how it really goes. So uh, if you're looking to avoid those things, um, avoid sauteing like vegetables or uh, fish, meats, you know, they'll add like a glob of butter and they'll call it nappe, which is pretty much them just basting the meat in the butter, uh, basting the meat with butter in the pan. So you want to go for like grilled items. Grilled items um, tend to still have like oil on them, but they'll usually be like canola oil uh, more than anything, which is a, a pretty good oil, a healthy, healthier oil than most. Um, so, and then braising technique techniques if you see something braised and also uh if you want to you know if your waiter or the staff member there is knowledgeable of the menu which they should be ask them for no butter uh if it's at all possible you know if it's something that someone's making at our restaurant you know we're always making stuff to order a lot of our stuff is made right there to order and we have a very small kitchen and so it's eight, like people can like literally peek their head in i've had customers be like hey jc uh no butter all right <laughs> like i was like all right man Thanks for that. Um, so, yeah, definitely. So grilled is a good one. Um, braised techniques are good because there's not a lot of oil in that one, but it has a lot of flavor. Um, boiled is obviously good. Poached is good sometimes. Um, whenever you see poached, ask them what they're poaching it in if they are, are not telling you. Because sometimes people will poach like fish in, or vegetables in butter. Uh, <laughs> so you can do that water uh, or like stock or butter right and so just be aware of that poaching is not always mean healthy okay um yeah so what about um you kind of you kind of threw me through a loop there with the sauteing but it makes sense because um i'm thinking about times that i've been out to eat and let's say i'm getting a burger uh, like a cheeseburger bacon cheeseburger that I know is a thousand calories. That's fine. But I'm trying to, you know, kind of cut my losses and not get the French fries with it too. So I'll get some um, vegetables on the side. Typically it's uh, it's like a broccoli that comes out kind of shiny or an asparagus that comes out kind of shiny. Uh, what's the best way to order vegetables to, or otherwise I might just have uh, fries. Uh, vegetables grilled. So I would, I would go grilled or roasted if they have the roast option um, or broiled. Broiled is always a good option. You can always, and also with these uh, techniques, the roasted, the grilled, the broiled options, um, they'll usually use a little oil. Um, for grilled, not necessary to use oil. Uh, it helps for the seasoning to catch on to the vegetable. Yeah. But if you request no oil, no butter, grill it, you can add salt and pepper to the table if you'd like. Um, Roasting, same thing, not necessary to add oil, but for the seasoning to catch. Um, it's, roasting is a little tough because usually they're not going to roast to order. It's usually something they'll par, par cook or they'll have available, readily available. Uh, and then broiling is pretty much just, have you do, do you know what the broiling technique is before I... You, you, I think I've accidentally broiled some things um, and you just put it on like a million degrees. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's just pretty much like a, they'll call it a salamander or like a broiler. It's pretty much just top heat at like the hottest temperature imaginable. And they'll throw it under there and just let it like the outside char. That's also a good technique if you're avoiding those oils. Um, yeah, just stay away from frying, frying, stay away from sauteing mainly. And, uh, you know, do your due diligence about kind of telling them what you want. Otherwise, they're just going to do what they want to do. And if, yeah. uh, you know, if you go by them, they're probably add butter and oil and all the stuff you shouldn't be having. Yeah. Okay. I think that that makes a lot of sense. We kind of talked about the, the different ways the proteins are cooked, the different ways the vegetables are cooked. Um, a couple other things come to mind. There's a lot of things that kind of come in like either casserole form or uh, I'm picturing like 
uh, when you order things like mashed potatoes and stuff, what are some things that um, are kind of hidden behind the scenes in the preparation for those kinds of things? So soups, gumbos, stews, all this kind of stuff that's a bunch of things mixed um, together. So mashed potatoes, um, definitely you're gonna have your butter, you're gonna have your whole milk, um, lots of salt, probably add cheese sometimes, depending where you go, if they wanna top it with cheese. Um, that's definitely a dish um, I would avoid if I were to eat. Um, um, the thing about, so there's a lot of different, for gumbos and soups, you know, people are usually gonna be adding creams to it, heavy creams. They're usually gonna be adding butters to it. Um, unless you're looking at like a soup that's like vegetable stock, um, then you're probably better off. They're not gonna really, no one's adding butter or oil to like a chicken noodle soup. You know what I'm saying? Um, but if you're getting like a cream-based sauce, you're gonna get cream and butter usually. Um, like, so there's five sauces that are like the base of sauces in like the chef world, right? Uh, it's like one of the first things you learn uh, in culinary school, okay? And it's called, they're called the five mother sauces. You have your tomato sauce, uh, you have your, they call it the Espanol, but it's pretty much just a brown sauce, like your beef stock based sauces. You have your Belute, which is pretty much your like chicken based, fish based stock sauces that are thickened up. Uh, you have your uh, Hollandaise, which is pretty much just egg yolks and butter. So Hollandaises are bad. <laughs> And then, you, and then you have you have your bechamel. Uh, bechamel is pretty much your cheese sauce, cream sauces, things of that nature, right? So if you're looking for a sauce that, or if you see something on the menu and it's like tomato sauces are usually really good for you. They're going to have your, you know, tomatoes, whether they're roasted or sauteed or boiled, pureed with like onions and garlic. Um, not a lot of oil is going to be in those, right? Um, then you have your brown sauce and your white sauce. Those are gonna be like stock based and they'll usually add like roux to them, which is butter flour mixture uh, to thicken them up a little bit, right? right? So stock ratio to roux is not gonna to be too much because roux, a little bit of roux goes a long way to yeah. thicken up a sauce. Yeah. Uh, those are good. I mean, they're probably some of my favorite just because the amount of flavor you can extract from a stock, even if you make it, your, especially if you make it yourself. Um, but even if you buy like stock from the store, cook it down a little bit. Um, usually like I'll go and get the ones that are like not a lot of salt added or no salt added. And then I'll season it myself. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'll add root to them or I'll add like cornstarch and water to them. If I don't want to go the root route. Um, so those are good ones. Then your holidays is a pain in the ass to make. So I don't know if you've ever tried. It's a pain in the ass to make make and it's uh it doesn't hold well so if you ever make hollandaise you can only have it for one day wow uh, yeah unless you like get boxed hollandaise or something like that but if you make hollandaise from scratch it might actually won't even last a day it'll last you like three hours three to four hours depending how you make it wow so all the restaurants that are gonna have all the different kinds of eggs benedict they're turning over a lot of hollandaise sauce i guess Either that or they're using a lot of box mixes, depending <laughs> on the restaurant. If it's a good restaurant, like if it's like a, if it's a, not a chain, for example, um, nice spot, they're definitely doing their holidays in house from scratch. But uh, like I've even worked for like small brex breakfast chains before and it was box mix, you know, add some water, it'll last you the day for sure. Maybe even to the next day. So you and I have talked about this offline before, but um, as a, just a general rule, let's say somebody goes to a chain restaurant, um, not, not like a, a super high-end restaurant where there might be some of these more advanced cooking techniques used, but just a, just a regular chain restaurant. And they order a meal that you know has something like a non-lean protein that was cooked um, probably on a, grit, on a griddle, I guess it's called a griddle, um, like a steak or something, uh, a sauteed vegetable and a, a starch like mashed potatoes or something like that. And there's somebody who's 
um, keeping track of what they eat, what would you say they should add in as far as terms of cooking oils and butters and stuff as to what they can't see in that meal if they're logging in their food? Like three what items. What should they food. expect? No, how much should they, extra should they add to what they think they ate at that meal to account for all the, the fats that they couldn't see? Um, for sure. I mean, if you get like mashed potatoes, expect to add a little more than I guess you would for like a average mashed potato, I would say. Um, as far as the vegetable, if it's sauteed, that's really on, <clears throat> that's really on the, uh, discretion of whoever was cooking your food that day. Right. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how heavy handed they are or not. Right. Are they, squeezing out a bottle are they ladling the oil in uh what kind of are they heavy-handed or are they light-handed um so you kind of i would say like for example to saute an order of asparagus let's say you're probably looking at two tablespoons or a tablespoon and a half of oil on average around somewhere around there um i've seen people go super heavy-handed before and have to like strain the oil out before they plate it. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it's almost like a fry, they almost fried it <laughs> at a lower, temp lower temperature. Um, and then they just like strain the oil out, pat it down. Um, and then if someone's like, if you're looking at steak on a flat top or like a griddle, uh, com compared to like steak on a grill, uh, once again, you gotta, you gotta figure out where you're at. Uh, ask the waiter as much as they might know or might not know and try and figure that out because I've worked in places where the steak was seasoned heavily, just salt, pepper, maybe some Montreal steak seasoning and grilled, um, thrown in the oven to finish off to get to whatever temperature the customer wanted and plated or like sliced and plated. I've worked in a place where we had something called steak butter that we made and we would literally season the steak, put it on the grill, and after that first flip, we would just baste it in butter, right? Continually until the steak was finished. And so we would just literally continue to just be basting it in like, it was like a butter mixture of like butter A1 um, seasoning. It was like, it was intense. It was delicious, but it was intense. Yeah. Um, I've also <laughs> I've seen places that, like, uh, that are doing cast iron that add butter and they'll do that nappe technique. And it's just like, you just see the butter like pooling at the bottom and they're like just constantly basting it. So try and go grilled instead of like sauteed. And then if it is grilled, ask them, is there any added butter? Is there any added oils? You know, um, let your, uh, one of the techniques that I like to do, uh, because I'm not allergic to nuts, but I do not like to eat nuts, right? It's not, it's a texture thing for me. I don't like pecans almonds cashews I don't, not a fan um for the longest time it's still kind of to this day i just tell people i'm allergic you know so it doesn't accidentally somehow find it in my plate now i'm not saying tell people you're allergic to butter because they're gonna be like what the hell um but if you you could like tell tell a tell a waiter because sometimes waiters just will lie to you I'm, I'm gonna be straight up honest with you they'll be like oh no it doesn't and they don't even know it's like their first day or they just don't pay attention Right. If you tell them you're allergic to something or have like a something like the butter, it's dairy and it messes my can you just make sure no not a lot of butter's added? They'll go in the back and they'll be like, Hey, hey is there butter added to that? How much do you add? Don't add too much. Go, you know, go light. And they'll like do the do they'll like make sure if you tell them like, hey, I might not make it out of here alive if y'all give me too much butter, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Straight up, man, I'm telling you. So I'm butters again. <laughs> butters against my religion. There you go. Or like I got a heart, something in my heart, my arteries. Use arteries. If they hear that, they're like, oh God. Uh hold on, let me talk to the chef. <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh man. Okay, well that that's It'll work. Awesome. That's awesome. So I guess um it sounds like we kind of added up a lot of tablespoons of butter there. So I'm gonna say we ended up depending on the cooking technique and the chef, we ended up somewhere between two and four tablespoons of butter probably for most entrees. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Let's see, two to, you could even go a little higher, but yeah, like two to six. Okay, so I mean, that 
that if some if one of our clients or somebody listening to that is eating out let's even just call it once a day you know four times a week which is not unrealistic we talked in the beginning of this about how many um repeat customers you have i mean if somebody thinks that they're eating less calories than they're burning and they're and they're not making progress with fat loss if they're not accounting for that that could be the answer right there so that's a little bit mind blowing probably a little bit disheartening for people, but you gave some great strategies for dealing with it too. Cause I think it's not realistic to expect that people are just going to stop eating out at restaurants. That would be, that'd be ridiculous. Put you out oh, yeah. of business too, no. like that. Yeah, definitely not. So, um, and I think that, you can, sorry, I was just about to say, I think that uh, talking with whoever's front of the house, employees, uh, waiters, staff like that, and just letting them know, like, I don't want butter or I don't want oils or, um, a lot of bigger restaurants, if you say, okay, it's sauteed, I would rather it grilled or I would rather it boiled or um, roasted. They can definitely make those changes for you on that menu. That makes sense. So I want to move on. Sorry, good doc, the dog's attacking me in here. I want to move on a little bit from um, the restaurant stuff and just kind of talk about cooking in general. Um, most people listening to this probably have zero formal training, let alone the amount that you have in cooking. So why don't you give us just a little bit of um, low level information about if we're going to go out shopping for some basic knives to uh, prepare food at home, uh, cutting boards, what kind of stuff should we be looking for and how much should we expect to spend? Um, so I'm like, so my general rule is for knives. Uh, I think like a knife is very much like, a car, right? Uh, I think you kind of have to pick what you want uh, and what fits you. You know, there's tons of variety out there. There's tons of knife makers. Um, and so, yeah, there's they have tons of different handles. Like, so you got to figure out what handle fits you the best. Um, like, even right now, like, I'll show you one of, one of my newer ones. I got this one um, just like this past weekend, right? This is like an expensive, this is a very expensive knife, all right? The handle's straight, um, and it was actually a gift from a really good friend of mine. And this has to be like a $400 knife, okay. hands down, right? Okay. I wouldn't recommend that knife to someone that's not cooking every day or cooking eight hours every day, honestly, right? Um, so like I said, if you're not like, like for, for a car, for the car reference, the car analogy, you're a NASCAR driver, you need a million dollar car. You're gonna do 500 laps, that car needs to make it, right? If you're a commuter, you don't need that. You need a car that's gonna get you from A to B. Same thing with a knife, you know? Find a knife that fits you, that, that has the length for the job you're doing. Some knives can be like almost a foot long. Some are like smaller, right? You, exactly, you don't need a foot long knife if you're chopping onion at the house. Um, and then, so you should definitely pick your price point I would say you don't need to go over $100. You don't need to go over $50, honestly. As long as you have the knife that fits you, and then as long as you take care of it, there's different ways to take care of it, um, through like honing it on, on steel. Uh, you can find those in stores too, like a steel to kind of just keep the knife sharp before each use. Um, there's people who will sharpen your knives for you. There's YouTube videos to show you how to keep your knife sharp. And you can get a $50 knife or less and it can last you for years you know how long you get should a 500 a knife be? how long should a general purpose knife be yeah like if eight I inches have one or two knives like you know if i'm just cutting six up to eight press and vegetables yes yeah, so you're looking at like six to eight inches for an average like general purpose chef knife okay that makes sense i'm trying to think because sometimes <laughs> when you uh, when you get married, you definitely get a set of knives from somebody, and you end up using like one. Of <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, that you have that. You get the block, and you get all the knives, yeah. and you're like, what is the difference between this one and mm -hmm. this one? And and most people yeah. end up not sharpening them ever, uh, which I'm yeah. guilty of a lot. Um, so you know that rod that it comes with, that's for sharpening it, right? Yeah, so that's the, it's, it's pretty much, it's not a sharpener, it's a honer. Um, it's a, they call it a steel, right? And pretty much, if you use a knife the day before, you know, whatever grit is kind of on the knife, 
uh, shavings from the steel or from the metal or from the steel, it helps you kind of hone it and it'll, it'll like feel like you're sharpening it, but it's not really like the actual technique of making the knife sharper. You're just getting whatever grits on it to make sure it's cutting smoother, right? So you can only hone it so much until it's gonna be dull regardless. Um, then you'll actually have to sharpen it. There are like whetstones that a lot of chefs will use, um, but as far as like home use, they have, man, I don't know how much they are, but there's like these, uh, they're like two blades, like a handle, like Kitchen Maid even makes yeah. them, where you can just yeah. run your knife through them and that'll sharpen them. Um, if your knife is like, if your knife's like $500 or however much, don't use that on those knives. But if you have like a KitchenAid knife and a KitchenAid sharpener, like a cheaper knife, it's gonna sharpen it and it'll be fine, but it's gonna also, it's also wearing down your knife to the point where after, you know, a few years, the knife is just going to start being, it's just going to start losing yeah. a lot yeah. of the yeah. ability it's supposed to have. That makes sense. But yeah, so I would recommend, pretty good. I would recommend, um, I would recommend cheaper knives um, for just someone that's just like a casual cooker or ca casual chef. And I would, I would recommend cutting boards that are, um, I actually have a brand here that I was, I think I was looking up, uh, it's called San Jamar. Yeah, I've heard of that. S A N J A M A R. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, San Jamar. They have really great cutting boards for uh, for home use and for professional use. Uh, and they have like grips on them. They're cut. They're grip cutting boards, so you don't have to worry about sliding around the counters when you're cutting it or what have you. They're color coded which is great. So I, I have multiple cutting boards at my house um, and some I only use for protein. Like if I'm cutting like meat, that's the meat cutting board, right? So I don't get any cross, contamina cross contamination even after cleaning, you know? So I try to make sure like that's my meat cutting board, that's my fish cutting board, that's my vegetable cutting board or fruit cutting board. Is there any special technique used to clean cutting boards? Um... Dishwasher, really, uh, just kind of get a good scrub in there. Dishwasher, uh, bleach. If, if you if you have a wood, what'd you say? Bleach. So I have seen people do that. I was kidding. I, no, I literally. No, people have done. There's people out there that do that. They will like add light bleach, like a little bit of bleach, and I it still boggles my mind, but it's true. Like. There are people that do that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. But uh, no, I just stick to the old dish, uh, dish soap and water, hot water, scrub it as good as you can, maybe dishwasher. Um, if you have a wood cutting board, um, invest in some wood oils like that are made for food grade, food grade wood oils. Uh, but beyond that, no, nothing too crazy. Okay. Okay. Let's let's move on to some actual cooking at home then. What is the best way for our clients to prepare uh, these three foods at home, these three protein sources? Chicken, either breasts or thighs, ground meat, whether it's turkey, chicken, or beef, and beef, like as in non-ground beef, like some cut of steak. What's the most practical and best tasting way they can prepare those three kinds of proteins? Um, okay, I'll start with chicken. Um, I prefer darker meat, like the thigh, uh, mainly the thigh. I love like chicken thighs, um, marinating them and roasting them. Um, so I don't know if you know this, I used to do meal prep, right? And so a lot of my clients when I was doing meal prep, yeah, I used to do meal prep for like three years, uh, while I also had like other jobs, but a lot of my clients would be very anti, uh, chicken thigh, right? They always wanted the chicken breast. Um, so I did a lot of research on, on, like, why does no one want chicken thighs? They're awesome, right? Uh, and it was just, like, calorie count, of course. And But I found out that majority of the negatives from, like, dieting or from, like, trying to eat healthier that come with, that are connected with chicken thighs is all in the fat of the chicken thigh, right? The yeah. skin of the chicken thigh. Yeah. If you, you know, just eat the meat, um, 
and just cook with the meat. It's still, I think, a, a better cut than your, your bre chicken breasts. Um, but I would say marinate those, either chicken breast or chicken thigh. Um, I like citrus marinades with my chicken um, and then roasting them. Um, I like to throw it like at a high heat, um, maybe at like 425, 450 for depending on how many chicken thighs I'm doing. Like let's say if I'm doing like eight pieces of chicken thighs in the oven uh, and they're marinated and I like drain the marinade and I throw it in the oven, I'll throw it at like 425 or 450 really high for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then I'll drop it to around 325 and let it cook for another 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and what that does is that initial high heat will allow, some, I'll, I'll cook with the, with the skin on, right? So it'll allow that skin to brown up a little bit. And then when I drop the heat, the lower temperature, um, the meat doesn't tense up as much. And so you'll get a more tender piece, whether it's breast or thigh. Um, and then the marinade also helps as well to keep it tender. So the same either it's a thigh or a breast or as the high heat and then the lower heat. Yeah, if you're doing if you're doing skin on, if you're doing um, skin off, I would still recommend marinating both, either or. Um, and then I would say I would just bake it honestly um, at like three fifty until you get to that one sixty five. Okay. And what's a what's a cheap and easy citrus marinade? Cheap and easy, simple uh, citrus marinade. Well, uh, actually, this is a pretty cheap. It's one of my favorites. Uh, the recipe of mine, I'm like, you can kind of just play around with it. But pretty much, I take orange juice. Um, I take lemon juice, around like half, about equal parts orange juice, lemon juice. Um, I will cut like half an onion, real thin, like julienne the onion. Add that, some Dijon mustard honey, garlic, salt, pepper, and then you can also add whatever like spices that you like, spice blends that you like around the house. You can add that in there, whisk it up real nice, and then throw that in with the chicken in like a Ziploc for at least 30 minutes. You know, I like to say at least 30. Um, don't go over for, for something like that. I wouldn't go over eight hours. I would try and stay under eight, above 30. And you can roast that off or you can like bake that off or you can sear it and then throw it in the oven at 350 um, if you want to get some color on it. But uh, that's a really good one. Whew, dude, you are hungry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so that's, that's awesome on that. Let's move on to um, ground meat. I feel like this one's going to be kind of boring, but um, I, I only recently discovered that there's a way to cook ground meat where it ends up dry like a popcorn fart or there's ways to cook it where it doesn't end up that way. So what's your best way to cook ground meat? Um, man, I really, so I don't think I've ever had ground meat that wasn't like mixed with like some type of sauce. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I've never eaten ground meat straight up that I can think of or yeah, no. So, I mean, I always go for like a good spaghetti sauce or, um, uh, yeah, pretty much oh, that, do, you know. Do uh, we meat separate from that and then mix them together for a certain amount of time? Yeah, so like you can like, you'll cook ground meat um, and you can like add your tomato sauce or add your um, like beef sauce. There's different ways, like different sauces you can add to it um, or like do like a beef and rice or beef and grains. But um, depending too, I mean, if you have like, like for example i'm thinking about it right now we do we grind our own meats at the shop right we grind our maple sausage we grind our turkey sausage and we grind our chorizo um so those are two porks and one turkey uh what we do there is we are pretty much taking whole cuts and adding onion and garlic and herb and spices and um, like the turkey sausage will add like orange juice to it before we grind it um, for the chorizo, we'll like grind it first and then we'll add like a, it's pretty much wajillo peppers and spices, garlic. Uh, um, yeah, pretty much why. And then uh, 
What's the other liquid? Oh man, I need a, too many <laughs> recipes in my in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll pretty much blend up like a pepper sauce of wahios and then mix it in with the the uh, pork and you have like a chorizo. So those are other options. I mean, if you want to do like meatballs or like you wanted to do like a red wine uh, sausage, like a ground beef, you could always just take onions, garlic, cook it a little bit, add some red wine and then like puree that and then mix it with your ground meat. And right there you'll have like kind of nice little sausage where you can add to like a little like ball and not like a link sausage but like a little something you can roll roll up sear in a pan and you can add it you can eat it like that you can add a sauce to it you can add it to a pasta yeah yeah and really you didn't add any extra calories in the process of doing that with the you know with the wine and the the seasonings and stuff that's a great idea no you don't yeah i mean you're gonna have to so if you if you do saute it you're gonna obviously have to add oil but you could always just roast it in the oven and then you'll definitely not be adding any of those extra calories you can yeah. just go straight high heat 400 degrees and you'll be good to go all right best way to cook a steak at home. grill it <laughs> best way to cook a steak anywhere man yeah okay, i don't have a grill here in boise idaho um, you don't have a grill ah. what should i do inside got a, I, got a george foreman <laughs> no i broke up with george foreman <laughs> Sold them in a garage sale. <laughs> I have an oven. And I, have glass, I have an oven and I have a glass cooktop. Okay. Okay. Um, glass cooktop and an oven. Okay. Do you have cast iron? Is yeah, cast iron even? But I can't put it on the glass cooktop. Let's say I have a gas cooktop though, and I can use my cast iron. Yeah. No, no, no. I want. I, I like a challenge. Let's. You have. You have the. You have the cast iron you can't use. Oh, okay. You have an oven. So Richard, if you had a cast iron, you got the oven. I would say throw your cast iron in the oven at broil or like the highest your so, oven. You're on self-cleaning. Whatever it takes. Set it, right? set it on self-cleaning. Get it really hot. Yeah. <laughs> get it as hot as possible, right? And um Get your cast iron there. Get your steak seasoned on the side, ready to go. Um, after your cast iron's in there long enough, you can literally, you know, I don't know where your fire detectors are in your house, but just be prepared. And uh, <laughs> you, can, uh, I would, and what I like to do is I don't like to go, when my cast iron's super hot, I don't like to go oil directly into my cast iron. I like to get it on the meat first. So I'll just get the oil, like a little bit of oil and kind of rub it in. Um, and then go cast iron to your pan. I would close it up, let it sit there, still at that high heat. Your cast iron's still hot because it holds heat very well. Probably check it in like three minutes. Flip it, three minutes. And depending on how thick your steak, it, steak is, it should still be rare. And I would just drop, drop the heat to like 350 and then get it to where you want it. Wow. Medium rare, medium rare. Yeah. Never, I never would have thought about that. That's awesome. So if I had a if I had a gas cooktop, I would just kind of follow the same, same process, but get the pan hot on the flame then, right? Yes, exactly. Oh man, I'm getting so hungry. Okay. All right. So those that's those are great ways to prepare those common proteins. What's the best way to um, prepare vegetables at home so they don't suck and don't add a bunch of calories? Without a grill. Without a grill, right? Without a grill. Actually, so number one is grill it. Most most of our listeners will have a grill, so um, yeah, put them on some foil on a grill. grill. I love to. Yeah, I mean, I avoid the foil, but uh, I just also know that I'll lose a few pieces of asparagus. It's <laughs> great, right? But uh, <laughs> but I uh, no, I do love me some grilled asparagus seasoned up with a little bit of oil. Uh, but if you're trying to get good amount of flavor inside the house. Um, it's something you don't have to really like stand over too much. Um, I remember we were talking about par cooking earlier, right? Um, so one of the things that you can do par cook is pretty much you're boiling it, but not all the way. Um, if you want to add flavor to that, you know, you can add your aromatics to that. You can, and you can, you can take it all the way. But one of the things I recommend is, because um, one of the negatives about boiling 
green vegetables especially, is you lose the, the color and the crispness of it is like, it goes away mm. if you boil all the way through. If you par cook it, right? So let's say I do the same thing. I have my oil, I have my water, I add a little white wine to it, right? It adds some aromatics to it, salt to my water, flavor up my water how I want it. <clears throat> Bring it to a boil and I drop in green beans. If I just blanch it really quickly, 30 seconds, like 45 seconds, and then after I take it out and I drop it in ice water and let it cool down immediately, I can take that out of that ice water and I can drop it back into that same water and cook it to where I like it, whether it's crispy or a little softer. And from just that process of going from hot to cold, it's going to, <clears throat> it's going to allow you to keep your color of that bright green and it'll probably brighten up your color actually and um you'll have you also have better control over your uh your food you know it's a little softer so you know you i don't have to boil it for eight minutes you know it's like all right i just par cooked it and you can always bring it on later like i could blanch it today and tomorrow i could have green beans that are ready to go you know so, yeah um, so, yeah so blanching to boiling is a technique blanching to saute is a technique blanching to grilling blanching to roasting uh, roasted vegetables are amazing you know so you can always blanch it first and then roast it off so uh, yeah definitely different ways you could do it is there anything you're just gonna go straight straight roasted in the oven is there any tricks to that or just slice it up and throw it in the oven um depending on the vegetable because it's definitely i mean all vegetables are definitely not created equal so depending on the vegetable that you're roasting uh, and you have to know how you like it. Like some people, I have some family members that love their vegetables soft, right? I have me myself. I like my bite to it, a little crispness. Uh, so if I know, like for me, I like mine a little crisp, crisper, a little more bite when I eat it, I'm going to go at a higher heat because <clears throat> I want it to cook. I want the outside to get some color on it. Right. But I don't, the higher, the temperature, the quicker the outside will get, but the inside won't be able to catch up as fast. And so I'll know I'll still have some bite to it, as long as I don't leave it in there too long. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So that would be like my main uh, advice is how do you like your vegetables first before you, if you like it softer, I mean, then you're kind of, uh, if you're roasting it and you like it softer, go at a lower temperature, go at your 350, you know go to 375 and you're able to let it cook a little longer without it burning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, we'll be, we'll for be sure, add a first technique. Excuse me? What would be a good temperature for the first technique if you want a, a nice, um, you know, roast on the outside, but still kind of firm on the inside? Uh, 425. Okay. Is a good temperature. Uh, for like your green beans, your asparagus, uh, you can even go up to 450 with those. If you're doing something like, uh, right now I'm looking at like some butternut squash. So you're looking at butternut squash. Um, those, that's something else that I like to do at a very high temperature. You know, add a little bit of canola oil to it, salt and pepper. Um, like I'll cube it up and then I'll throw it in a, in a pan, throw it in the oven at like a high temperature. Um, and so for that too, you're just looking for something to able to like a knife to go in cleanly and come out cleanly. I think that's like the golden rule for a lot of like starchy vegetables. Um, so if it goes in clean, comes out clean, it's done. Uh, but yeah, high heat on those for sure. 450 is good where, good place to start. That's also the uh, cakes and cookies where you stick the knife in and it comes yeah, out clean. Yeah, it is. <laughs> comes out clean, you can eat. Well, maybe not a cake, not right away, but you can, you got something good, man. So those are those are great techniques. A lot of times we hear people say that they hate vegetables, but I think the main reason is is they just don't know how to cook them. They're picturing pulling some frozen vegetables out of the freezer and throwing them in the microwave until they're just destroyed and soggy and don't have any kind of seasoning. Yeah. So what yeah. is there any just like super basic seasoning that you would recommend on vegetables to make them taste good? Um well like there's spice ones that are great like I'll, I'll throw a McCormick steak seasoning uh, I'll throw that on my asparagus my green beans like ask you can ask Sarah if I'm grilling 
McCormick steak seasoning is going on like everything. <laughs> like it's literally, it's so easy. I'll put it on the steak. I'll put it on asparagus. Like I'll do a like whole like corn. I'll put it in the corn and I'll wrap the corn up. Like I'll put it on everything, right? And she's always talking about like, oh, McCormick steak seasoning again. Ugh. But then she'll be like, oh, this is so good. <laughs> oh, it's so delicious. <laughs> It's like me with so, the that's seasoning around here. I put it on everything and it ends up tasting good. Exactly. As long as it comes out good. Uh, I know um, I have some friends from like the Northeast because uh, I worked up there for a little bit. They love Old Bay. Um, I like it on fish, uh, but they go they go a little overboard with it. But I think that's really good. Good seasoning. If you want to go, it goes good with vegetables. So if like you wanted to add like Old Bay to your uh, to your water that you wanted to blanch with, you can add Old Bay to it. If you wanted to add McCormick season, I mean, if you want to add like Tony Shatteries, you know, you can really, it's whatever your palate likes, you know, go for it. Yeah, I think that's, that's huge what you just said there because people just get hung up on saying that they don't like something, but that they don't actually try those kinds of things that you're talking about. And, and the bottom line is that's the stuff that gives a lot of these foods flavor. You know, you're talking about all these cooking techniques techniques and stuff but you got to figure out a way to add flavor to it too so um i hope people take that to heart and try some of these different seasonings in addition to the techniques otherwise they're just going to be stuck saying that a certain food is boring which is crazy yeah for sure so oh, we'll get... and something i was just thinking about um, yeah something i was just thinking about uh don't don't underestimate acid like fresh lemon fresh lime um on vegetables as well as proteins so if you're like finished cooking a vegetable or finished cooking a steak squeeze a little fresh lemon juice over that or fresh lime juice um for things that you think like aren't delicious if you're like oh i don't really that little bite of acid really gets your uh, taste buds going you know yeah isn't there like a documentary salt fat acid heat something like that have you seen that? i haven't seen it i don't watch a lot of cooking shows Okay, I don't know. Nah. We don't either. Make me 200. <laughs> so right. let's say that we didn't eat all this stuff that we cooked. What's the best way? I know you can't talk about every single food, but in general, what's the best way to reheat leftovers so they don't turn out terrible? Oh, man, you're going to hate my answer. Don't eat leftovers? <laughs> uh, no, my microwave, man. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a microwave guy. Uh, like, so if I go out to eat, my and my main reason is not for like if you really want like the best way to get like the best product, then you should definitely use your oven mm -hmm. uh, to reheat these foods. You know, get a you know throw them all in like a cast iron or throw them in like your cooking dish, like a baking dish, and like heat them up that way. If the whatever the restaurant or whatever you had is not like oven proof, but for me, I'm like such an, I'm in and out. Like, I don't want to be in the kitchen when I'm at home too much. I can avoid it. Uh, and so I'm just trying to like get a little rest in before uh, the baby attacks me or the restaurant calls. So I'm just like, I'm a microwave all the way. But Sarah's, Sarah's all oven. So I don't think I've seen her reheat one thing that was in the oven, to be honest with you. Yeah. So if you have time, pretty low temperature. Between the yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, it depends on what it is again. Like, so if you're reheating, like if you're reheating steak, let's per se, uh, I would go higher temperatures if you want to try and keep it as mid rare or however you've had it before, uh, just so the outside gets hotter and the inside, you know, you don't want to go like low heat. And then everything is just gonna cook, and then you'll have a like well done steak. Um, honestly, yeah, the only thing I can think of is like keeping it like a lower temperature, like casseroles, mac and cheeses, um, any, any dish that's like super dense, uh, like pasta or like super dense dishes, mm -hmm. because for it to penetrate that, you know, the outside will get super hot before the inside does. So yeah. you'd want to go at a lower temperature yeah. or something like that. But if it's like vegetables, you can always go high heat, uh, get it done as much as you want. 
Yeah, that makes sense. That's good. Uh, now that you explained it, it makes sense. If you use my technique of a low temperature, you, you would end up recooking the whole thing and probably overcooking it. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Overcooking, yeah. Okay, well, we covered a ton of ground so far, and I don't want to keep you all night, but there is one last thing that I want to talk about because I know it's um, it's definitely an interest of mine, and I'm pretty sure it's an interest of yours too. It's uh, whiskey. We both have a taste for whiskey, and um, I used to have a whiskey collection, but I kind of pared it down when we moved, donated it to some friends. Um, that's not true. I drank most of it. But anyway, so what's... Uh, <laughs> Tell me, tell me, um, like what? Are, what are your summer favorite? What are your, some of your favorite whiskeys? I'm a bourbon guy, but really. Um, just so people know, there's a, all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. Bourbon has to be made in a certain way mm -hmm. um, to be bourbon. So, what are your favorite whiskeys and bourbons, or what are you kind of dealing with these days? Um, so my favorite bourbon right now. So I, I'm a, I wouldn't say bandwagon. <laughs> I guess that doesn't, that doesn't really apply to this, but uh, I can jump around from what could be my favorite bourbon today than what was my favorite bourbon like six months ago. Uh, right now, my favorite bourbon is a, a Willet bourbon, um, something I got on my birthday uh, last year, and it was just a beautiful bottle, and I drank it. It was really smooth. I really like that. Um, pretty pricey, so I don't get it as much, um, but I like Willet as uh, probably like my top bourbon right now. Um, Bullet is probably a close second. I love Bullet bourbon. Um, and then whenever I, whenever I'm out drinking uh, pre COVID, it was probably like a Maker's Mark. I'd probably get a Maker's Mark. Um, yeah. And then my favorite whiskey right now. What happened? Bullet is definitely an underrated, easy to get bourbon for sure. I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that for sure, man. Uh, and then whiskey, I like, a, there's a brand called Uncle Nearest that I really enjoy. It's not a bourbon, but it's a whiskey that I try to always have in my house because I love me a whiskey and ginger beer with a little bit of lime from time to time. And uh, that's definitely uh, something I can drink straight or I can add ginger beer to. But, uh, you know, if I get my ginger beer, I'm happy. If it's straight, I'm still still happy. Is that a homemade recipe or is that does that have a name, that mixture? Oh, whiskey ginger beer or the yeah. uncle nearest no the uh the whiskey ginger beer mix i've never heard of that before did you make that up oh uh, what you never had whiskey so you never had whiskey oh, ginger beer i don't really love the taste of ginger unless it's with sushi uh so that's probably why i've never had it mm. so, okay yeah i mean it definitely have you had you've never had ginger beer before yeah, I've tasted it, but not enough to finish it. Like, uh, what is the other drink? Like a Moscow Mule? Isn't that ginger? Yeah. I don't like that either. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't like ginger beer, I mean, I wouldn't recommend a whiskey ginger beer. But uh, it's, it's, it's actually a good combination. The whiskey, I mean, I, I only do like a splash of ginger beer. I add some lime to it. It's a simple enough cocktail for me to like get when I go out if I don't want to just drink straight up whiskey at that moment. But I, I mean... At the house, I'm probably 80% of the time just drinking whiskey straight up. Anyway, yeah. So. yeah. Neat, neat is the way to go once you get there. Mm -hmm. I imagine with, um, oh, well, first of all, that Willet that you're talking about is the one, is the one that kind of like has a really tall neck and a really flat bottom in that bottle. Oh, man, you're knowledgeable. <laughs> so here's, here's the deal. When we lived in Houston, um, I had my whiskey collection on this really cool um, homemade floating shelf in our dining room. Um, it was basically like these little metal brackets that were shaped like an L and then a two by 12 running across the top of them. It was probably five feet long. It was hung in our dining room. That's where I had all my whiskey. And um, on my birthday, I got several bottles of whiskey and some of our good friends gave me um, a one and a half liter of that Willet that you're talking about. And I, I opened it to taste it and put it back on the shelf. And then we went over to Blakely's parents uh, that night for my birthday, and they gave me a bottle that they picked up um, somewhere in South Carolina, I think. And um, I went to bed and I put that bottle on the shelf before I went to bed. And by this point, the shelf was kind of leaning forward a little bit. Fast forward to the next morning, Sunday morning, um, we're sitting there having coffee and we hear a crash, a small crash. I, I run into the dining room and I witnessed the entire shelf rip out of the wall and almost 40 bottles of whiskey hit our hardwood floor all at once 
with all, I mean, you can't, and you can't imagine like the amount of glass that that made and the amount of bourbon that soaked into our hardwood floor in the time that we were picking up all the glass. I want to say only, only about six bottles survived that fall because the shelf was probably up like five feet in the air too. So I'm pretty sure that that bottle of Willet being one drink down and being such a big bottle was the main contributor to that shelf ripping out of the wall. So <laughs> that was another thing that put a big dent in my bourbon collection. So I have, I have bad memories about that. Um, yeah, that makes I, wish I, had, I wish I had your connections in the restaurant industry though, because those guys get all the, the bottles that are hard to find, at least for tasting. But well, cool, man. This was really, really fun. I enjoyed um, learning about this stuff. My mind is kind of scattered right now because I learned so many different things. And I really think that there's a lot of good takeaways um, for our clients. Is there anything else that came to your mind that you want to tell people or at least remind people how they can find you guys there at the shop in case we're, our Houston listeners are near you? Oh, yeah. Well, um, so we're Bel Air, we're right outside the loop, uh, Houston, Texas, Dandelion Cafe. Uh, 5405 Bel Air Boulevard. You can find us on Instagram at Danline Houston. Uh, find us on Facebook, Danline uh, Houston. Um, if you want to find me, my social media uh, is Instagram mainly, and it's quinoa89. So uh, it's a grain, Q U I N O A. I know it's tough. I don't know why I picked it. I mean, I have a little inside joke reason, but yeah. I'll be not. Uh, friendly for the families and uh <laughs> you know, my little. and uh yeah follow us um we make great breakfast brunch coffee uh everything's like 90 percent of our stuff's made in house and you know we're very friendly we have still tons of people from uh blakely gym still come in and uh patronize us all the time and you know we're always what do y'all want you know no butter no egg whites <laughs> with the egg whites you know we got it so anything it's so true. Do to help keep you on track for your, uh, for your health health goals. You know, we're there for you. you know, everyone yeah. needs coffee in the morning. So that's awesome, man. Yeah, well, I definitely would not have had you on here if I didn't have a lot of respect for you personally and for everything you guys are doing. You guys are awesome, and I'm glad to call you guys friends. So thanks for your time, and uh, really appreciate you uh, doing this for everybody. So we will check everybody out on the next episode.